Good morning and welcome to the 12th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2020, which again is an online meeting. I would ask all those taking part, please ensure that your mobile phones are on silent. The first item on our agenda is our third public evidence session on the Forensic Medical Services Victims of Sexual Offences Scotland Bill at Stage 1. Scrutiny for the bill began in February uh, but was interrupted due to the pandemic. We are now taking evidence during May and June with the intention that Parliament will be able to debate uh, our report on Stage 1 in the autumn. Today's session gives us the opportunity to discuss implications of the bill for forensic medical services for children, including the provisions in the bill to make self-referral available only to those uh, over the age of I welcome to the committee this morning, Chloe Riddle, Policy Manager with Children First. Thank you, Chloe, for joining us today. Uh, due to the challenging nature of managing a virtual meeting, uh, we're going to be a little less spontaneous in, than usual and take questions in a pre-arranged order. I will begin with the first question, then ask each member in turn to ask questions, and then invite you to respond. Once each member has asked, their questions, I will invite the next question and so on until the evidence session is concluded. Can I ask all concerned, please, keep questions and answers succinct in order that we can uh, cover all the topics that we want to discuss today. Please, when you are called, give broadcasting staff a few seconds to operate your microphones before beginning to ask your question or, or to give your answer. Uh, can I start, Chloe, by uh, asking you about your approach to the general principles of the bill, some of the evidence we received both from yourselves but also from others such as the NSPC talked about missed opportunities or things uh, that might also have been done in addition to what's in the bill. So can I ask you, first of all, uh, what's your view of the general principles of the bill as they relate to children and young? Chloe. Yes, uh, thank you. Good morning, committee. Um, we, Children First, really welcome the opportunity to, to give evidence today and appreciate the value that the committee is placing on progressing this important bill amidst the, the pandemic. Um, it's important, I think, to begin with, to be clear that Children First really warmly welcomes the introduction of this legislation um, and considers it to be an important step forward as part of the overall forensic medical examination improvements for adult victims um, of sexual assault. The evidence today um, that, that I'll be speaking about, that I'll be providing on behalf of Children First, will focus on what we know from our services, the experience of children and families within our services. Um, and I think the, the probably the, the, the most important thing to start off with um, is to, to recognise that there is a significant issue that the bill is trying to address um, that was highlighted in the um, the Her Majesty's um, Inspector of Constabulary's report, um, which found major issues um, for, for those who've experienced rape or sexual assault in Scotland. We really um, strongly agree with Rape Crisis Scotland and other organisations that there's a need for continued leadership and significant ongoing investment to bring um, services in Scotland up to the standards which survivors need and deserve. Um, the evidence that we've provided, our written evidence, has been really clear um, that the, there are significant issues relating to children that are different to, to what um, affects adult victims. Um, we know that um, the majority of children uh, do not disclose abuse during childhood. We know that it will be small numbers of children who do disclose um, and small numbers that disclose um, abuse within that specific seven day time frame required for forensic medical examinations. And for children first, the, the key question here is about asking why that is and what we can do to ensure that there are improvements, wholesale improvements to the entire system, not just small areas of the system. Um, for us, that means there needs to be a rights based response to make sure children's voices are heard to make sure that their physical and emotional needs are met um, and that there is an interagency interdisciplinary response that takes into account exactly what um, what a child who's experienced abuse needs to help them access justice but also recover from trauma. Um, so our, our, the answer to that, um, I'm sure the committee's um, 
heard of um, uh, the things that we've been been speaking about before, but Children First has called for a long time for a barn house model in Scotland, um, which looks at um, what, having everything in one place, a child friendly approach to, to access to justice. Um, so for Children First, in terms of this bill, um, we think that there is um, real value in considering what forensic medical examinations um, look like for children and for their families, but we would want it to be wrapped up in an overall discussion about what's required for children within the context of the barn house model. Um, so I can comment on the a bit further on the specific things in the bill, or, or is that enough for... That, that, that's certainly enough to get us started. I think, <laughs> Robbie, you're saying uh, the, that you support and welcome the general principles of the bill, but there are areas you would like to see uh, a, a more holistic approach. Is that fair? Sure, I mean, yeah, I, I think I think so. I think for adult victims, um, it, it's a different conversation. Um, what Children First proposed uh, in the initial stages, the initial consultation before the bill was laid, was that there would children would have a have a specific consideration, and we've not seen that within this bill. So I think there are different um, areas that that. Um, uh, that apply to children and, and make sure that we don't cut across some of that work that's ongoing in other areas around Barn House. Thank, thank you very much. And um, your mention of Barn House is a prompt, I think, for me to ask Emma Harper to ask her questions. Emma Harper. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Chloe. I am interested in picking up a couple of questions about the Barn House model. We, um, in the policy memorandum, for the bill, it, on page 8 in paragraph 34, it says the Scottish Government is committed to exploring how the Barna House concept could operate in Scotland, which includes consideration of cases where the child may have suffered other forms of abuse, for example, child sexual abuse. And you know, the Barna House, it, it says it provides Scotland with an opportunity to design a genuinely child-centred approach to delivering justice, care and recovery. So it's in the policy memorandum, and I, I like how the, the Barna Hoos means Bairns Hoos in Scots <laughs> and Children's in, in English. It shows how connected we are to our Nordic neighbours. But I'm interested, Chloe, if you can tell us a wee bit more about uh, uh, whether you su the bill does support the Barna Hoos model. Yes, Chloe, thank you. Okay to answer. Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that that's a, the the central I think part of of our um, what we want to talk to the committee about today. I'm not sure if the committee is aware, but um, the Barn House is recognised as a child friendly, multidisciplinary, and interagency model responding to child victims um, and witnesses of violence. So it's not specifically, um, according to the European standards, it's not specifically about um, child victims of sexual abuse. The model that we would be looking at in Scotland, um, that, that Children First are, are really clear that we'd like to see adheres very closely to the European standards. Um, Healthcare Improvement Scotland are working to develop Scottish specific standards, but as far as possible, we hope that they'll adhere to the European standards. Um, and the the central point of the barn house is that everything happens in one space. So in terms of forensic medical examinations, it's not always possible for children to attend a barn house, um, you know, in other countries um, to, to attend a barn house when there are acute needs, um, particularly when there's um, an issue about ensuring that evidence is taken within that um, seven day time frame. But as far as possible, we would hope that um, children's physical and um, medical needs would be met within the barn house when, the, when those medical needs are not acute. Um, the government's been clear, as, as it's mentioned in the policy memorandum, that um, it's the preferred destination for child victims and witnesses across Scotland. Um, and we're now considering a lot more about how this will work in practice. Children First has just received a £1.5 million grant from the People's Postcode Lottery to begin to pilot um, a child's house in, an, in an, um, one of the localities in Scotland. We're at the early stages of planning on what that would look like. 
But I think it's important for the committees to be aware that this isn't a vision or a pipe dream, that this is that this is ongoing. Um, and we have some concerns about parallel processes going on where we might be making small improvements in silos, but actually what's needed is wholesale, whole scale um, response uh, uh, change for, for ch children and for their families. So um, the program for governments committed um, to exploring how the Barnhouse uh, concept could could operate. Um, and I, I think as the um, Vulnerable Witnesses Bill was going through, uh, the Minister for Community Safety was really clear about the government's support for Barnhouse. So we're concerned that this bill may cut across some of that work inadvertently in some cases, uh, may have unintended consequences and um, the impact on the progress of the Barnhouse approach. Um, now, we know, I know that the, the Child Rights and Wellbeing Impact Assessment does state that the bill supports multi-agency working and is Barnhouse ready, um, but we're not clear how in practice this will happen and how it will align to the Barnhouse provision, particularly if there is um, a pathway that's being developed, which we've been part of through the task force's subgroup, um, and if there is guidance um, around how this will apply for children in terms of the bill. Is what we are uh, looking for is, as I said, this kind of holistic interagency model of support, whereas this bill looks at a very specific area around health. Thank you very much. Emma Harper. Thanks. Thank you, convener, and thanks, Chloe, for that response. Um, I think when we took uh, evidence at the roundtable session, Sandy Brindley, when we were speaking about children and the, and the, the processes for supporting children who have experienced uh, abuse, um, Sandy Brindley suggested that we we have a whole maybe a separate approach, a separate bill that uh, that we would maybe have to look at down the line at that. I might need to go back and check on the official report to see what was specifically said. But uh, I, I, I guess the issue of unintended consequences in relation to developing this approach is that one of your main concerns, Chloe? Is that there will be some a silo working or some cross cross purposes working, which may not then take into a, approach the best model or the best processes for for children. Yeah, I think. I mean, so, sorry. <laughs> I think it's um it's really important to be really clear that we recognise that that um this is a really vital, particularly for that this bill is particularly important for adult victims. Um, in, for children, I think we've been talking about a different kind of approach because we don't want to be creating separate parallel processes um, and we don't want to inadvertently, um, for example, invest in, in um, lots of um, important and really state of the art suites uh, that, that are child friendly that sit separately or out with a process when we look at what a barn house would, could be. Um, and as I said, our intention is to begin to pilot this. So it's not it's not something that will that we're looking at within you know ten years time. Although hopefully in ten years time we'll have something that um, that works across the whole of Scotland. Um, and our kind of caution around some of the measures within this bill is is ensuring that that it sits within a wider framework um, of of what works for children. Okay. Thank you right. very much. Thank you. Uh, David Stewart. Thank you, uh, Convener. Good morning, Chloe. Uh, one of the key elements of the bill is self-referral for forensic medical examinations to young people. Are you comfortable with 16 being the minimum age for self-referral, and if so, why? Chloe Little. Thank you. Um, that is a good question. Um, as we stated in our written evidence, our understanding is that for the majority of children and young people under the age of 16, child protection processes would apply. Um, we would agree with the evidence from rape crisis that we wouldn't want to add in what Sandy Brindley referred to as a meaningless right, um, given the statutory duties and processes options to involve um, child protection um, and the police where it's where it's necessary. And of course, Children and young people's safety has to be a paramount concern. Um, however, we do note the evidence from Dr. McClellan that you had heard last week um, that we don't want to miss opportunities to ask young people to come forward and that there are some cases that aren't quite as clear cut. We have um, uh, experience of that 
within our um, own services, particularly relating to when children have been victims of child sexual exploitation, but might not necessarily recognise that they are victims. Um, on balance, uh, children first use that there needs to be a rights-based approach to this, taking into account a child's evolving capacity in line with the UNCRC. Um, we recognise that there may need to be room for professional judgment and for risk assessment. And we also note that um, Social Work Scotland have submitted some evidence around 16 and 17 year olds and some of the complexities around the varying different pieces of legislation um, around that and particularly issues around a legal capacity. Our central point, Children First central point, goes back to what we were talking about before, though, um, about understanding why we're having these discussions about self-referral. And the vast majority of children who experience sexual abuse do not receive a forensic medical examination, do not report that they have um, been abused. So we agree again with rape crisis that we need to be much more realistic about what else needs to happen to reduce underreporting. Um, for Children First, the answer is not necessarily um, having some of these broader discussions about self-referral, but, but going much higher level than that and looking at the entire system and what needs to change so that children and families feel comfortable um, and are able to, to receive a multi-agency response that um, is, is a, allows them to access support as well as um, access to justice. The children have a right to recovery, um, and at the moment that recovery need is not being met. Um, our sense is that if there was a system that allowed children and young people to speak out in a safe way um, and that there was much more of a holistic response um, that we wouldn't need to be having some of these discussions about why people aren't referring and what, what we can do to address that. Yep. David Stewart. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you, Chloe, for that answer, which I would generally agree with. However, there have been calls for the age limit to be lowered to 13 from organisations such as Victim Support Scotland. Would this Lowering of the age not help detection and prosecution of child sexual abuse, particularly within families, which has been historically low. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, I think that the 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 issues around li um, lowering the age limit are quite complex. Um, when you add in the the complexities that I set out relating to child protection, so. Uh, I, I don't think it would be possible for us to have a, a sort of a blanket statement around, say, say 13 year olds because of the interaction that the duties and the professional responsibilities to engage with child protection and police. Um, there is some further thought and consideration, I think, around what evolving capacity looks like um, and what what would be necessary um, in order to make some of that a realistic option. Uh, um, I think for us, it's probably a bit of doing a bit more thinking and a bit more discussion with organisations like the police and Social Work Scotland and some of the child protection organisations who um, who would be able to talk about what happens in practice around some of that. And, Thank you very much. And through you, can, uh, briefly, can yeah. could I? Yeah. Hmm. yeah, David Stewart, one final question. Yeah, thank you, uh, Convener. My final question. I mean, my my concern is, as, as someone who's worked in the front line in social work and child sexual abuse for many, many years, is the low detection rate. And I do, if you're talking about rights, then lowering the age of 13, with the proviso that any self-referral would require evidence to go to the police, would seem to me to give more rights to 13 to 16-year-olds and hopefully improve the detection rate of child sexual abuse. Very well. Yes, uh, as, a, as I mentioned before, I think our children first position on that is that if we had a barn house process um, in the, or a system in Scotland where children and families would, would ensure that their needs were met, their physical needs as well as their emotional needs were met in one place. There would be more of a wraparound service and we would, we would encourage, we would meet, we would uh, be able to meet um, the needs of children who've experienced abuse in one place, and, and hopefully that would mean that um, the children feel much more comfortable in talking about what's happening to them in disclosing abuse, and that would that would be one way of um, of ensuring that those very low referral rates or very low low reporting of abuse um, actually um, become that it becomes much more visible. Thank you, Alex Goldhampton. 
Thank you very much, Kamina, and good morning, Chloe. It's lovely to see you again. Um, I have a, a brief follow-up question before I move on to my substantive questions, also in this area of age of referral. And I just wonder if you could tell us, without the barn house model that you very eloquently described, um, young people who have suffered a sexual offence will have to go through rather the rather traumatic process that we as a committee have already heard firsthand from those who've been through it. Can you just explain the sort of trauma that might be associated with the experience of presenting at say the archway and getting a forensic medical examination without the wraparound support of a barn house model? Thank you. Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the the children and families who um, we work alongside have experienced um, lengthy delays in waits often. Um, I think there, some children even go as far as to say that the, their experience of the justice system as it currently is um, almost makes it, almost um, re-traumatizes them, almost um, adds to the existing trauma that they already have. And I think in our evidence, we spoke a little bit um, about um, uh, forensic medical examinations specifically reported shortages um, in pediatricians, um, difficulties gaining and maintaining experience um, to, uh, due to low examination numbers. Um, we've heard of children having to wait for hours in a medical examination room um, and when it takes place there have been a number of professionals in the room. So there's a lot of work to do in terms of what that experience looks like for children. Um, but for us it's, it's not um, looking at that improvement around specifically just around medical needs but um, making sure that there is a whole system response so what a child needs in addition to uh, addressing those acute medical needs or um, uh, uh, perhaps in, in another circumstance looking at improvements to joint investigative interviews or improvements to um, how uh, the court system works but that kind of wraparound support so that right from the moment a child discloses abuse, they feel safe um, and that there is support provided to them and to their non-abusing parent or to their parent or carer. Um, and that support continues throughout the whole process so that it doesn't become even more traumatising in addition to what they've already experienced. Alex, go ahead. Thank you very much, Chloe. Um, so is there a possibility that if we start promoting self-referral for those aged over 16, firstly we might unintentionally act as a barrier for younger victims coming forward and I suppose the corollary to that is um, are, are we anxious about um, driving people, younger people into a system that may additionally traumatise them when there are other routes where they can uh, receive justice and attention to their uh, defence they've suffered? Very well. Yes, I think that those are really good points. There are lots of unintended consequences that we really need to think through. Um, one of the things that we raised in our evidence that might be coming up later, I'm sure, is um, that, that this bill is very narrow, deliberately very narrow in scope around children who've experienced sexual abuse. Um, but we know that there are um, medical examinations required for children who um, have not experienced sexual abuse, but who um, have experienced other types of abuse. So we have some concerns about um, accidentally creating a two-tier system where you have statutory provision in one area and non-statutory provision in another area. I think um, Mr. Cole Hamilton raised issues around um, uh, if we were to raise awareness, for example, around reporting, um, what does that look like if you've not experienced a sexual offence and, and would, uh, would, would we not want to be encouraging those, those um, all types of offences to be um, for, for children to come forward and to talk about it. But what we really need to do is to make sure that when children come forward, when they speak, when they're brave enough to talk about their experiences, that they're met with a trauma informed, compassionate, rights based response that doesn't just cover, that, that's not sort of fixed in one specific area, but that, that is wholesale across the entire system. Thank you very much. And a final question from Alex Colhand. Thank you, Kamina. There may be a situation where a young person would not want necessarily to involve the police right away, but may wish to self-refer so that any evidence could be gathered and collected and used in the future. Do you, to your mind, is there, would there ever be any situations when self-referral for people under the age of 16 would be appropriate given the current system? 
Yes, I, I think I, I mentioned um, in my initial response around self-referral that I think it was Dr. McClellan who talked about um, a, the, the requirement, the need for professional judgment around in some cases. We absolutely don't want to put barriers that mean that children do not talk about what they have experienced um, because they feel that um, you know they don't want to involve the police at a certain time. Um, I've mentioned um, previously as well, uh, this is particularly relevant for us around child sexual exploitation, where a child may not necessarily realise, it may take, take a while um, for them to realise that what they've experienced was actually abuse. Um, and I think that, so there are some issues there to think through, but the, the primary, um, the primary way of looking at it, I think, is is again um, ensuring that it's rights based, that we consider what evolving capacity looks like, um, and that we look at it within the context of the current child protection system, um, because we do not want to um, accidentally uh, put in place measures that are not possible to to implement or, or suggest to children that they would be able to undergo forensic medical examinations without the involvement of the police if there are statutory processes or um, professional duties to refer to child protection um, in order to keep them safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brian Pittle. Uh, thank you, Kabina, and good morning, Chloe. And I think uh, following on from that question, I think you've already mentioned that uh, Social Work Scotland uh, suggested that if referrals always remain confidential uh, unless uh, the individual subsequently contacts the police. It could be at odds with child protection. I think what we're trying to do here in terms of if we're going to legislate for this, it's important that, that there's a flexibility within the bill that allows uh, the kind of treatments uh, that you have indicated, Chloe. So can I ask first whether you think the provisions in the bill are or should be in line with child protection guidance? Chloe, Yes, I, I think this goes back to what we were talking about previously about children. I mean, children are not actually referred to in the bill at all. We don't have any specific provisions for children. There is no reference to child protection processes at the moment. Um, so there is probably some work to do to think that through a little bit. And if we, if the decision is that, um, there would be additional guidance or we're looking at the pathway again we have some concerns about how that might cut across what we're trying to achieve around barn house there are definitely complexities around confidentiality and around child protection but these don't just apply to forensic medical examinations um, and to medical examinations is certainly not just around sexual abuse. It's much broader than that. Um, so uh, to some extent it, it's, um, it's a much wider discussion um, uh, in order to ensure that there is real clarity for professionals about what the expectations are and how we keep children safe, but also we don't um, prevent children from coming forward to talk about what they've experienced and to gather that really important evidence at the within that seven day window so that um, if children want to at a later date, then um, they can access that, that justice um, element of, of their, um, their recovery journey. Thank you very much. Brian Whitlock. Just a wee supplementary to that question then from your answer there, Chloe. I just want to, to uh, check that you think within the bill here, uh, there's, there's the child protection element uh, of, of uh, abuse uh, is kind of missing from the bill, and that's something that, uh, that, that needs to be considered. Chloe, yes, I mean, there, there are very distinct needs that children and young people have, um, particularly relating to, you know, when they've experienced abuse. Um, as it stands, the bill doesn't differentiate between a child and an adult, and it applies to examinations just carried out around sexual offences. We've already talked a little bit about some of our concerns about what happens if you if you narrow it in scope to that that specific area and, and the possibility of that two tier system. Um, and again, it's, I, th I think what we're talking about here is much wider than just around forensic medical examinations. It's about a whole system response to any type of abuse um, that includes justice, it includes health, it includes social work, it includes education. So that because children, we know that children do not separate this. You know, they don't work in the silos that we do. Um, but it's about the whole the whole framework. Um, so they are not going to be thinking, right? This is my 
forensic medical examination, that bit went really well. Now I'm going to move across to my interview. You know, it, it's it's um it's about the whole system response. We've always been really clear that any proposals to strengthen and improve forensic medical examinations for children must align effectively with wi with wider child protection processes. Um, so forensic medical examination, as I said, should form part of a holistic, multi-agency approach to protection needs. Um, there are there are complexities that don't apply to adults. Um, there are certain complexities around vulnerable adults, but for children, there may be interactions with the hearings, for example, um, and wider kind of risk and safety assessments. Um, there is there is obviously potential for children to be looked after or to be removed from home if there's a if there's a risk um, to their safety. Forensic medical examinations, um, we we said in our written evidence must be seen as fully supporting the child protection as well as the justice processes. Um, and as it stands, that there isn't anything in the bill um, around that. Um, and I think that there is potential for there to be some guidance. But again, the, the issue, the concern we have around guidance or around a children's pathway, specifically around this, um, is that it wouldn't then be part of a whole systems um, kind of approach that, that the Barnhouse would offer. Thank you very much. And a final question from Brian Biddle. Yeah, FM, thank you, Kevin. And I think just go back probably to, to uh, David Stewart's point. I think if, if the expectation is that uh, a self referral by a 16 or 17 year old could initiate a child protection process, I think the question would be then why uh, the, self the self referral provision isn't extended to, to uh, children under the age of 16. Glory Biddle. Mm, yes, uh, as I said, there are, you know, a number of complexities and, and at the risk of sounding like a broken record for us, it's about taking that rights based approach. What does what's what's in the best interest of a child of the ch of the child um, involved? Um, I think the there is some further thinking to do about that child protection processes with the other legislation that Social Work Scotland has. Um, and on the other guidance and processes, there's um, an update of the child protection guidance that's coming as well. So there's a lot more to think at through than me kind of just being able to give a, a, a cut and dry answer um, here. Our sense is that the priority has to obviously be keeping children safe, which is why the child protection processes might kick in. Um, but there needs to be some kind of allowance for professional judgment and for flexibility um, because there is such a narrow window to be able to collect that evidence um, and it, it's obviously important to a child's recovery needs that where possible and where they want to they're able to access justice and the the forensic examination is an important part of that thank you very much and now for a slightly different uh, topic or angle uh, david Tomlins. Thank you, convener, and good morning, Chloe. Are there specific issues that relate to the ability of looked after children over the age of 16 in accessing self-referral services? And should they be able to access self-referral services without triggering police involvement? Chloe um, I don't think I'd have much more to add than than what I've um, what we've kind of said um, already for, for for all children. There are obviously um, really important considerations for looked after children um, and lots of um, consideration about existing child protection processes that they may already be involved in. Um, I think that the, the, the key area here, the, the key thing here is not to, so we, we're not separating children into groups of, you know, um, this is this would be the response if they're looked after, this would be the response if they are, you know, coming from a, a you know, socio particular socioeconomic background, etc. We're talking about children um, and children who have often experienced really horrific um, abuse. And our our um, uh, our children first view is that that we need to be looking at what a multi agency response would look like that takes into account both their physical needs and their emotional needs. Um, that ticks the boxes around access to justice, but also supporting the recovery. And I don't think that there is um, there needs to be a, a significant difference between how we would respond to a child who's looked after in those circumstances and how there's a and a, and a child who is um, still living at home. David Thomas. 
that's that's it, Camino. Thank you very much, uh, Chloe. Just just on on that last point, just to be clear, when uh, a a person who's been a looked after child has uh, uh, is covered by the bill, as you say, the the, the self referral aspects covered everyone over the age of sixteen. Uh, while I take your general point that you don't distinguish between one group and another, other specific questions around self referral that you think might uh, be more pertinent. Uh, for 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 young people who have been looked after children in the past, very little. I think I think that's um is probably something that's worth exploring a little bit further. I'm probably not able to comment in a lot. Of, um, certainly the the children's reporter um, and organisations like Who Cares would would probably be able to would would offer a particular view about the particular needs of. Um, and, and that interaction with looked after children, um, as I mentioned, I mean the the bill is 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 not uh, is not specific about the interaction with the child protection processes. Um, I imagine that that might be considered within the pathway and the guidance, but there's there's certainly some consideration about how it might work and how we keep children safe. Um, you know. Um, uh, when an assessment is made about about what that looks like and where they're currently living and and how to how to ensure um, that they're able to access the appropriate support that they need and to access justice but also to keep them safe at, um, in their current situation thank you very much Georgia thank you convener uh, good morning uh, I would just like to ask there is quite a debate with regards to children and young people who have alleged to have perpetrated sexual assaults and abuse, and there is a number of organisations that have different opinions with regards to this. Uh, the NSPCC has commented that it would support the provision in the bill being extended to cover forensic examination of all children and a statutory basis for the provision of ther uh, therapeutic interventions to address children's harmful sexual behaviour. However, Rape Crisis Scotland believe that the bill should not extend, be extended to cover child pre perpetrators. So, my question would be to Children First: What would your opinion be on the p potential of the bill being extended? Thank you. Um, I think there are some practical considerations around that um, that need to be to be taken into account. Um, uh, we, we mentioned in our response, and I think others, including Rape Crisis, did about the importance of training, the importance of um, ensuring that there are the resources to make sure that um, that there are secure and safe spaces um, and appropriate spaces for children and young people. Um, there are some practical considerations around uh, making sure that um, if you have a Child who's under the age of 18 and who requires a, an examination and is alleged to have perpetrated an offence, that they are not going to come into contact with, you know, meet in the corridor, for example, somebody who um, who is accusing them of a crime. So uh, there are some very practical things I think to think through. Children first would take a rights-based approach about what the rights are of, of the children in in both of these situations. Um, but I think there's there's some further thinking that needs to be done to be done before I can give a definitive answer there. Um, we must uphold the rights of children in both of those situations, both children who have perpetrated or alleged to perpetrate crimes and meet their recovery needs, as well as um, as children who who um, have experienced crime as, as well. Georgia. No, thank you, convener. That's everything. Thanks. Thank you very much. I have a brief supplementary in the same area from Brian Whittle. I wonder if uh, Brian Whittle would. Uh, thank you, Gibby. One, one of the things that, that we discussed uh, last week was uh, retention of evidence and records and the length of time that that should happen. I wonder, in, in your experience, uh, uh, Chloe, um, with, with the potential for children to much later in life. Uh, decide to act upon uh, upon that evidence. What your opinion is of how long we should re retain that record across a sort of multi agency, if you like? Yes, we we've um, put some detail in our written response here. There are a number of issues around the safe storage of information pertaining to children, which I think goes back to 
what we were discussing previously around, around there not being specific recognition of children within the bill, um, because there are clearly um, specific issues for children um, that need to be considered, um, and as, as you've um, pertained to in your question there. We have um, experience of children who um, have decided to revisit a disclosure much later in life. Um, I think I mentioned previously, particularly around children who have experienced child sexual exploitation. Um, at the beginning, we, we know through our work around child sexual exploitation, um, uh, the parliament will have heard this before um, when we were, we were legislating for this, that children often don't recognize themselves as victims initially. Um, and it may take a little while um, for that process, of, for, the, for that understanding um, to take place. We have experience of a number of um, young people and adults who have returned years after previous contact and shared. They now recognize that what they experienced was grooming or was abuse um, in a way that they were not able to understand or communicate when they were younger. Um, it's not cut and dry. I think a lot of the children and, and young adults um, do not subsequently want to make a further disclosure, but I think it is important for that option to be there um, as much as possible. Um, you know, um, uh, and it's, it, it, I think for some children and young people, having the option there um, to consider and to think through um, whether it might be appropriate for them or might help in their recovery journey is really important. But it goes back again to what we've been talking about, about um, what would prevent somebody who has got, the, who, if we've got forensic medical examination stored for them from wanting to access justice in this way. And we need to take a really hard look at what the justice system looks like and why it would prevent children and families from wanting to seek justice in that way. And there are a multitude of different reasons, um, but our sense is that if we had a multi-agency response that was child-centered, that was trauma-informed, that allowed children and young people to share their story in a way that wasn't traumatizing, that we might be able to um, increase that reporting or increase the number of um, of convictions that we see because children and families would be much more willing to share their stories. Thank you. Thank you. Miles Briggs. Um, thank you, convener, and good morning, Chloe, and thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I wanted to pick up on some of your answers to David Torrance and to George Adam with regards to supporting children, and wanted to ask you um, what you felt the bill needed to include uh, to support children with additional needs and disabled children. Thank you. Um, just going to find my notes on that one. Um, the um, the bill itself, as as I've mentioned, doesn't have any specific mention of children at all. Um, the policy memorandum says that the government's view is that um, the healthcare response must be sensitive to the specific needs and circumstances of children and young people, but the, it's completely absent in the bill. Um, our view is that children have the right to recovery. We're about to incorporate the UNCRC in Scotland, um, so we must make sure that we are meeting children's recovery needs um, in a way that is currently not happening at the moment. There is a lack and absence of, of um, adequate, high quality um, recovery service support services for children. Um, others have highlighted, the NSPCC has highlighted along with us that um, there is a stat this bill would include here a statutory duty for forensic medical examination, but not for other aspects of justice and recovery for children. And again, this bill is only looking at sexual offences. So there are wider issues about children's recovery needs beyond um, those who have experienced sexual offences. We don't want a system where we have put in place statutory um, obligations around children's recovery needs for um, sexual offences, but there are no similar statutory obligations around other areas. Um, and I, I think for us, the, the parts four and five of the bill that look at, um, I think the part four looks at things like um, the information to be provided for children and part five um, looks at healthcare needs or the obvious places to, to add something in. But I think we need further thought before we kind of just add amendments in there, because um, again, a children first view is that there needs to be a whole system look at this, a complete redesign of the system for children. Um, so it's not simply adding in additional supports um, for children around 
uh, recovery needs around sexual offences or around forensic medical examinations, but what it looks like when a child discloses abuse and what their recovery needs are um, in the in the, the round. Um, so it, it's a really difficult. I know that there, some of the evidence has um, suggested a, a second bill or a part two bill. I think that you mentioned that before um, in your question. I think um, Sandra, but the um, the issue for us is that a holistic wraparound support must accompany um, any forensic medical examination, whether it's forensic medical examination for sexual offences or for other offences. And the bill at the moment doesn't doesn't achieve that. Very much, Miles Briggs. That, that's helpful. Thank you, um, Chloe. In terms of um, if we do look towards including children in the bill, how would you like to see support put in place? For example, for youth work organisations to be involved to provide peer support, um, and what would that look like as best practice? Do you feel? Very little. I, I would express some caution, and I sound like a broken record, I know, um, but the, the the concern that we would have is if we are legislating for specific um, support services for children who've experienced sexual offences, that leaves other children who have experienced other types of offences without the, the kind of support that they would require. Um, there is obviously a huge gap in terms of therapeutic support, the type of support that children first provide, for example, where um, we look at the recovery needs of um, the child and the non-offending parent um, and, and other, other third sector organisations that are able to do that. I think you're right to mention advocacy and peer support. But again, this is, this is not specific to forensic medical examinations. This would be um, for children to meet children's recovery needs who have experienced abuse. And so that, that's not limited to what support they'd require around a forensic medical examination, but what support they would require to recover from their experiences. Um, and I, I think the, the issue that we have here is that if we put something into, a, into the bill at this stage around um, children's recovery needs, and then we have guidance about how that would be implemented or a pathway document, we then have a parallel process to the Barnhouse process. Um, so it's absolutely vital that we make sure that children are able to access the kind of supports that we require. But I have some concerns about this inadvertent um, uh, putting in place things that then um, either contradict or, or unintentionally run parallel to, to what else is happening in the kind of wider context for children. Thank you very much. And a final question from Miles Briggs. Thank, uh, thank you, convener. Um, you touched upon this earlier, but I wanted to, to ask, with regards to the reporting um, of cases, I believe Bernardo's evidence suggested um, they've doubled in the last four years of the number of cases of sexual offences committed by children against other children. So I wanted to, to ask specifically um, what other models of, uh, around the world are you aware of, especially I know there's been work going on in this field in indigenous popu in populations in Australia and North America, and, and whether or not there is a model already in different uh, legal systems. Thank you very much. Uh, Chloe Riddle. I'm not sure if I've mentioned the barn house before. <laughs> Um, but, <laughs> but I think for, for that would be the starting point um, for us. There are, there are a number of um, examples of, uh, and, and the, the thing about the barn house is that in, in, in different countries, it works in different ways. So as I think I mentioned, Children First would like to ensure that what happens in Scotland is that we adhere as closely as possible to the European standards. Um, and I think that there is some room within there to look at what's happened, you know, the examples from other countries, what's worked and what's not worked. We've done a number of fact-finding missions to Iceland um, and to some of the other countries. We're part of um, the Promise Exchange, uh, which is a network of um, of countries that have implemented a barn house and, what, and we're able to draw some of the best practice from there. Um, so I think there's a lot of internet, you're right, a lot of international learning that we can do, that we can look at. Um, and of course, seeing as we're about to incorporate the UNCRC, there's a lot of thinking that we can do about what that looks like for children who've experienced or who are victims of crime, um, who, are, who are victims of abuse, um, and for children who um, are living in, in um, you know, wh whose recovery needs um, need to be met um, elsewhere as well. 
Thank you very much. And I have a supplementary on those questions from Emma Harper. Emma Harper. Thanks, convener, for letting me in again. It is just to continue with what Chloe is saying about Barna House. Um, obviously, Health Improvement Scotland are working with the Care Inspectorate, and I, I'm referring back to the policy memorandum. And there, it says here that the Care Inspectorate and his have been commissioned by the Scottish Government to develop Scotland-specific standards for Barna House based on the European Promise Quality Standards. So. I'm, I'm concerned that if we piecemeal an approach with this bill to look at Barna House, that it won't have the the expectations or the, the the needs of children being met in this bill. So it's just to ask Chloe again to what do we need to do? Does a whole separate Barna House approach in a separate bill need to be created? Or are, are, are we at risk of just having a piecemeal approach if we don't add it completely in this bill? Very much, uh, Chloe. Yeah, I mean, I think you very neatly um, um, summarised our concerns and our worries of this bill. Um, the our view is that we we need to make these improvements to the different parts of the system, but we need to look at it as a whole, um, whole system redesign instead of um, trying to make the improvements separately in different silos. I think it's a really difficult, um, a really, a really challenging discussion about what should happen next. Um, I, it's, it's probably a broader conversation with the government um, and with, um, you know, with the committee about and, and with the other organizations including police and health and social work about what it looked like we are not clear yet um, over exactly what legislation would need to be required because we don't yet have Scottish standards and um, that's the first step as you mentioned is is working with healthcare improvement scotland on what scottish standards would look like um, but as i've mentioned a number of times we want to ensure that um, the uh, standards um, and the any guidance or any pilots um, are are real um, multi-agency response and they have the buy-in of all the different sectors involved I think it would be we have some concerns about some of these parallel processes that have really good intentions um, but that might accidentally cut across some of that other work that needs to be considered as a whole thank you very much and for our final area of questioning Sandra Hart. Uh, thank you. Oh. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you. I've turned into my harper now. <laughs> thank you, Gina. Uh, thank you very much, Gina. And good morning, Chloe. Uh, thank you for your evidence so far. It's been really, really interesting. I was interested in the data that's being collected, uh, and I do notice uh, your submission where you mentioned about subject access requests, and in particular, uh, parents seeking access to full for, um, medical records, uh, considering that sometimes, unfortunately, it's the parent who's carried out this uh, particular uh, crime. Uh, basically, so the first question I wanted to ask was whether there are any specific data protection issues that need to be addressed in relation to children and uh, young people. Very little. Thank you. This is something that Children First have um, raised a number of times, both in terms of the criminal courts and the civil courts. Um, it, we are currently discussing with um, the um, Justice Committee the um, Children's Scotland Bill and have raised um, with them issues about ensuring that children's best interests are at the um, heart of any decisions to share the information that um, the children first hold um, and that others may hold um, with with p potential perpetrators of abuse um, within um, discussions around, say, contact, for example. I think the same principles that we're discussing there apply. Um, as we mentioned in our evidence, um, we know that some parents have sought to conduct subject access requests I mean, in some cases have been successful around medical records um, and we'd certainly um, encourage further thinking to ensure that um, that there is I mean it's, it's, it's the same discussion I think around uh, the civil courts that we do not want to put in place barriers to access justice or for um, 
for the courts to explore exactly what's happened. But I think we need to ensure that uh, children's best interests are taken into account. Um, and in some cases, when we're talking about the potential um, sharing of personal, private, sensitive information with possible perpetrators, alleged perpetrators, or convicted perpetrators, that there are clear safeguards put in place around that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, thank Sandra White. You. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe. I think this brings in the difficulties which have been raised previously in regards to it's not just a health issue. You're talking about the Justice Committee, which is looking at this, and you've spoken to them too. So if we were going further on this particular bill with the Children's, uh, you know, added into it. We need to correspond with the justice committee as well. But a further uh, question I'd like to ask, and it's regarding forensic medical examination. Do you think that uh, the information from the forensic medical examinations uh, should be linked or be part of an individual's healthcare record? And that would bring me on to obviously confidentiality and the rights of the child. That they have you know, ownership of their health records. Yeah, I mean, we the information that children first hold is not necessarily um, around health health needs. So I think it's probably some questions there for the health boards and for um, the, the legal professionals around what kind of information is able to be accessed. Um, what I can say, though, is is the the same discussions that I said as as much the, the discussion around civil courts is around different type of information that we would probably hold, but it's the same principle that um, a child's best interest should be taken into account, um, and not necessarily to that 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 means that information should not be provided to courts or that information should not be shared, but that it should, that it should be shared in a way that's proportionate um, and and really crucially that that they're aware of what's happening to their information and that that information is uh, that that they have a sense of um, of who is being told what um, and that their voices and views are being taken into account. Um, we're absolutely not saying in either the criminal or the civil courts that, that information should be withheld um, where it's pertinent to a case, um, but, it, but that it's done in a manner that is sensitive um, and that takes into account children's rights. Can I ask a follow-up question? Can I just follow up question? Uh, yes, Sandra White. Uh, in your opinion, Claire, or you know, the, the group's opinion that you represent, if we incorporate children's rights into this bill, would you agree or would you say that confidentiality and ownership of any of this data and the forensic medical records should be the ownership of the child? And if the child is too young for that, advocacy. Because having read your submission, my great concern is that Okay, perpetrators or you know people who are accused of it can access information which they can further use against the child, <clears throat> and that's a real concern to me and many others, obviously. Yeah, I think it would be hard to comment on the specifics without kind of looking at any proposals. Um, but it's it, for us. It's about the principle of um, ensuring that there is. I mean, in some cases, it's really appropriate for information to be shared with the court in order to secure a conviction. This is really what we're talking about here around forensic medical examinations. That we need to have all the information and all the evidence, but that but that it must be gathered in a way that is trauma informed um, and that takes into account children's rights, so that they don't feel like the process is is traumatizing for them. So they don't feel that information is being provided and they don't know what's happening or they don't know, um, which, which again, I think brings us right back to that higher level, broader discussion we were having about what's the wholesale experience for children? What do they experience, um, not just around forensic medical examinations, but around um, the court processes, around interviews? Um, and, and what, uh, what, how does it all knit together in a way that's trauma sensitive and, and leaves children feeling that their recovery needs have been met? Um, some of the systems and processes at the moment we know are really traumatizing, but our view is that we can't fix small parts of the system, that we need to look at it as a whole, and this, that this is a really important part of that. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Kirina. 
Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to Chloe Riddle for your evidence this morning. Uh, that I think has been extremely helpful to the committee, and I'm certain there are some of the issues that uh, have come up in the course of this morning's evidence that we will be following up uh, with others. So uh, thank you very much to Chloe Little for your participation. That concludes the public part of this morning's meeting. Our next meeting, uh, the next meeting of the Health and Sport Committee, will be at the same time next week, 10 o'clock on Wednesday, the 27th of May. Uh, we will be uh, uh, discussing testing in the context of COVID-19. Uh, and further details will be uh, made public in the business bulletin and via the committee social media in the usual way. As previously agreed, I will now move the meeting into private session. Uh, and so uh, I uh, therefore suspend this meeting. We will meet again at five past 11. Thank you very much.